Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Freemasonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. I'm your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 189 in the news. So first things first, 189 episodes in 11 more eps until we'll have our 200th episode. Maybe something cool will happen on that episode. We'll see. Uh, keep supporting Birmingham Lodge's auction to help them out. All monies donated go directly to the auction to purchase items and such to support the various charities they're involved in. Also, if you or your lodge has a charity event to promote or you want to have me mention it on this show, just shoot me an email. I'd love to. If you read a piece I put out on the Midnight Freemasons last week about clandestine masons, thanks. Spread the word. I'm a tolerant guy, but the incident really bothered me, so I had to write about it. It was an interesting topic. Many thanks to those who are ordering the pins, the pre-sale of the lapel pin, the WCY lapel pin that is. Our delivery on those will be at the end of this month or early next month. We're really looking forward to getting them in and shipped out to you guys. In addition, three other items are going to be coming out with those pins and will be extremely limited, so keep your eyes peeled. How limited? like 25 of each of them so it should be pretty interesting to see how fast those go i think you guys will really enjoy them and if you just can't wait to get those pins we do have the five dollar button pins and i can send those out right away i make shipments every monday on books and pins what book tales from the craft what else tales from the craft is an amazing book by brother Stephen L. Harrison, who has also written another book called Freemasonry Crosses the Mississippi, and he's also the managing editor at the Missouri Freemason Magazine. So if you're interested in that book, check it out. We did have an amazing show on the Masonic Roundtable last week. We talked about one-day conferrals, the Master's Class, the Grand Master's Class, the Blue Lightning, whatever you want to call it. We had a great episode. We had great discussion. We talked with Brother Adam T. Osmond, the man who wrote Earning Freemasonry. I hope you guys check out that episode. It's on YouTube right now, and I hope you join us every Tuesday at 10, 9 central. I wanted to ask you guys a quick question. If you all have something like a light blue club or a young Masons club or something like this, shoot me an email and tell me about it. I would love to get some ideas about it and possibly read them on the show. What I'm looking to do is possibly start one in my own district, so I'm looking for some help. I wanted to address Masonic Radio Theater. What happened, right? So... Uh, Bill Hosler has been working a new gig. He's really busy, and I switched schedules at work, but we're working on a new episode right now, and we have another one being written, so it's coming, guys, and I really apologize for the delay. I wanted to say that after the paper this week, stick around for Brother Stephen L. Harrison's Masonic Minute. And without any further delay, let's get right into the paper for this week. It's called Forever Conceal and Never Reveal the Secrets of Freemasonry by Eugene L. Goldman. Past Master. Brother Goldman is a member of Blackmer Lodge No. 442, Free and Accepted Mason, State of California. He served his lodge as master in 1993 and currently serves as chairman of its Masonic Education Committee. While serving my lodge, I had an occasion to call on one of our entered apprentices to ask about the reasons for his long absence from the work. Like all too many men who join our fraternity, he completed his initiation and then disappeared. He had several reasons, the demands of the business he had picked up, some personal issues requiring his attention at home, scheduling problems with his coach, etc. All these were valid but there appeared to be more to this than he was letting on. After some more conversation, the truth was revealed. He was concerned about his obligation, particularly about the penalties for revealing our secrets. Our brother is a man who is very interested in symbolism, metaphysics, and what we call our esoteric work. The reason he sought out a lodge to join was to write some papers on our symbolism. He explained that he became alarmed when taking the obligation. We never informed him of what secrets he had just vowed to protect. We simply advised him of grave penalties for failing to protect them. This caused him concern, as it was his goal to bring some light to non-initiates in his writings. Being a man of much honor, he felt it better to go no further in our mysteries, to be free to explain some of our symbolism to non-Masons. Symbolism versus Pragmatic We entered a discussion of the penalties. The need for protection of our secrets was and is self-evident. If everyone knows our secrets, we have none. Having none, we are no longer unique or even special. Nothing then remains to induce men of good moral character to want to associate with us. 
We discussed the historic nature of the penalties. Without addressing the accuracy of our alleged descent from the Knight Templar, there have been other times in history when Masons have faced death simply for being Masons and living according to Masonic principles. Hitler, Franco, Khomeini, and others have issued death sentences for free thinkers. We teach our candidates to be free thinkers by nature of our ceremonies. He was surprised to learn that under Masonic law, the strongest penalty a lodge can impose on a member is simply expulsion from the fraternity. Although to most Masons, separation from the craft would be far worse than the grisly acts described in ritual. The term no less a penalty applies here. In a great measure, the thought of revealing our secrets to the unentitled should cause revulsion in the minds of our membership. The secrets themselves. What are our secrets? Today, in this country... Our existence is well known. Published phone numbers and meeting times, even the jewelry openly and proudly worn by many Masons is evidence of this. That we use mystic ceremonies embedded with symbolism to impart moral and ethical lessons to our novitates is almost as well documented. Any interested person could enter a specialty bookstore, purchase a book or two, and learn the essence of our ceremonies. At the local Masonic Center in my area, there is a bookstore, well stocked with books on and about Masonry and writings by Masons. Many of these books clearly explain our ceremonies and the reasons for the manner in which we exemplify them. Within the same building, there is a library containing hundreds of volumes of writings by countless Masonic scholars. Most of these books discuss either the theory, either the history of the craft, or the ceremonies and symbolism we employ in our work. Who we are, what we do, and how we do it are clearly not secret. We proudly refer to our modes of recognition as the only secrets in our craft today. In my library at home, I have books describing our ritual in detail. These books have clear English text and include our cherished modes of recognition, complete with diagrams. These books were purchased at a wonderful little bookstore in the business district in my neighborhood. Any interested person with a few dollars can do the same. Though Masons treat the modes of recognition as secret, they could not be considered unknown outside the craft. Secrets Defined well, what does that leave? It sounds like it's all out in the open. Our existence, methods, ritual, even the ways we recognize each other are known to any expressing an interest. The real secret of our craft is the spiritual and emotional growth we encountered because of the experiences we shared. The true mysteries of Freemasonry are contained within the acts of being conducted around the lodge room, kneeling at the altar, first learning the grips and words and the several degrees, and participating in the third degree ritual. Experiencing this as we do firsthand cannot be described in words. As with many other life experiences, you have to be there to really understand it. Words could only confuse the issue, never explain it. What this means to us, my brother, what does it mean that we are required to keep all this secret? The prohibition against unlawful disclosure of these secrets is meant to protect our ritual from corruption. It is not prohibited to instruct a candidate in the work. Proper instruction of candidates is strongly encouraged by lodges. Candidates, coaches, the unsung warriors of our fraternity spend hour after hour personally instructing candidates in a myriad of areas. The ritual work, the history of Freemasonry, even proper lodge etiquette are topics of much discussion. They spend many additional hours sharpening their proficiency in the work to do this more effectively. They patiently answer the hundreds of questions posed by candidates. Officers spend evenings away from their families to attend practices to improve their work in California. Coaches and officers are required to attend district schools of instruction and, when proficient, they are certified by district inspectors. Inspectors are supervised by assistant grand lecturers. These men come under the oversight of the grand lecturer. The Grand Lodge of California and most of its constitute lodges have active communities on Masonic education. This elaborate system exists to ensure that candidates receive proper instruction. Work is done only in a tiled lodge by qualified officers. Coaching is done in private settings by skilled and dedicated men. In this way, the ancient landmarks are preserved. If degrees were to be conducted by the unqualified, errors would begin to seep in and keystones would begin to change or disappear. The essence of the work would change and those elements that make it what it is would be lost. Thus, it is easy to see why the admonition against unlawful disclosure of our work exists. The flip side. That is it. All I have to do is leave things to the officers and coaches, and I have fulfilled my obligation? Not at all. 
Remember promising never to reveal those secrets unlawfully? That promise contains a hidden injunction to reveal lawfully. Relate the emotions you feel in Lodge to your family and friends, and to the way in which you conduct your life. Share what masonry means to you by your conduct out of the Lodge. Remind yourself why you are a mason. Let the world see, by your actions, evidence of the growth you experienced. Promote your Lodge's activities and invite non-Masons to social activities. They just might get caught up in the spirit of brotherhood and ask to join. Maybe they'll ask, how may I become a Mason? Then, discuss the membership and degree process with him. If he asks for a petition, help him fill it out. Introduce him to other members of your Lodge. Lawful disclosure of our secrets. Signing a petition also carries with it a moral obligation. It obliges you to support our new brother through his Masonic travels. Be present at his degrees and proficiency examinations. Patiently answer his questions or refer him to his coach. Sit with him at lodge dinners and in lodge. Be to him the friend you told your lodge he was to you. Being a member of a lodge enjoins you to attend whenever you can, even if you are not an officer. A full lodge room for an initiation expresses the love and the fraternity to the candidate and encourages him to become more active himself. Doing these things will go a long way to fulfilling your unstated obligation to lawfully communicate the secrets of Freemasonry. Become a true and faithful brother and encourage others by your actions. Meanwhile, back at the coaching room. Remember our candidate? As this paper is being written, he has actively resumed meeting with his coach. He is looking forward to completing his degrees and writing many excellent articles on the craft. I know he will be happy as he forever reveals and never conceals much of the non-secret information about our fraternity. He will be happier still as he lawfully communicates many of our secrets. All right, now is the time in the show when I ask you to support the show. We have a few different ways. Of course, we have the applications available for Android, Apple, and Windows phones. Benefits to those is having the papers we read on the show right in your palm of your hand. We also have Masonic wallpapers for your mobile device and, on occasion, other items like either books or short film clips, movies, whatever it might be that's Masonic related. Again, you can do some shopping on onit.com, at freemasonryart.com, or at freemasontees.com. Use the coupon code WCY at checkout and you'll get 10% off and a little bit of your purchase comes back to this show to help keep those lights on. You can purchase a button pin for $5 and spread the word about the show. There is the lapel pin pre-sale going on right now, 100% brass solid brass lapel pins with 24 karat plated gold. There's only a little bit of gold on there, but it's still really cool. And a deluxe E-clasp on the back, so these things aren't going to fall off. Delivery on those is going to be late this month or early next month. And we've already got our envelopes filled out for those of you who have pre-ordered. We're just going to be able to package those right up, slap the postage on, and they get them out to you right away. So for 10 bucks, you can get yourself a lapel pen. They're $2 shipping, so I think it's a $12 donation total, and that will come straight to you. And last but not least, we do have our PayPal direct donations. So whether you choose to donate a dollar or two, that just comes right to the show, and it helps keep us going on into the future. Any way you support the show, you are a producer of Whence Came You. Next up, we're going to go right into illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison's Masonic Minute. So you think you'd like to form your own Grand Lodge. How do you do that? You have, say, three lodges, maybe a hundred brothers, and you're in an area that really has no Grand Governing Body. Maybe one of those lodges in your area is chartered from Missouri, one from Kansas, one from Illinois. But you're not located in Missouri, Kansas, or Illinois. And as much as you like your brethren in those states, you want to determine your own destiny. You want to be your own Grand Lodge. Now what? You might think it's a very formal process. You know, you find a well-established Grand Lodge and ask it for a Grand Lodge charter. You might then think that request is followed by much pomp, circumstance, and fuss, after which you become the Grand Lodge of you, and a member of a very select group. According to Ronald D. Miller, 
past Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Missouri, it sometimes happens that way. But back in the early 19th century, when communication was a lot harder, things were different. Back then, the process was more informal. The area lodges would more likely get together, decide they wanted to be a Grand Lodge, declare it, and announce to the world, Hey guys, look at us. We're a new Grand Lodge. Wow, that's easy. But there's a catch. Other Grand Lodges have to recognize you. This is, of course, sometimes easier said than done. Which brings us to the case of a group of lodges in the young state of Missouri who, after much deliberation, decided it was time to strike out on their own. Three lodges in the state spearheaded the effort. Missouri Lodge No. 12, Jacob Lodge No. 25, and St. Charles Lodge No. 28. They met in April 1821 and organized the Grand Lodge of Missouri. They elected officers, established policies and procedures, and made the big announcement to the world, Hey guys, look at us. We're a new Grand Lodge. Then, that recognition thing came into play. All three of the lodges, instrumental in the formation of the Grand Lodge of Missouri, held charters from the Grand Lodge of Tennessee. It seems among them, the three lodges owed the Grand Lodge of Tennessee the huge sum of $17. Being fiscally responsible to its members, the Grand Lodge of Tennessee responded to Missouri's claim to be a new Grand Lodge with, oh no you're not. Missouri's response? Oh yes we are. And with that, the Grand Lodge of Missouri was born. There is an epilogue to this little story. Not too long ago, I flew to Chicago to make a presentation. Another brother on the same program flew in and we met at the airport and waited together for our ride. We had never met before, but he knew I was from Missouri. So as he walked up to me, he stuck out his hand and shook mine and said with a big smile, I'm from Tennessee, and we forgive you. Yes, in the long run, accounts have been settled, harmony prevails, and today, the Grand Lodges of Missouri and Tennessee have a strong bond of friendship, reaffirmed that day at O'Hare Airport. For the Whence Came You podcast, I'm Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. And I hope you guys really enjoyed that. Brother Stephen L. Harrison always gets us something really cool. And just a reminder, we do have copies, print copies of his book that I can send you. I ship anywhere in the United States for $18 and anywhere in the world for $25. So check those out and we'll get them out to you as soon as possible. We take a lot of care in our packaging and presentation of that book, so I'm sure you'll enjoy unwrapping it. All right, this week's famous Freemason. Starting to hit a few of the famous Masons who were president of the United States. This week is Warren Gamaliel Harding, or Warren G. Harding. Born in 1865 and passed away in 1923, he was the 29th president, banning from 1921 to 1923. He was a conservative politician from Ohio. He had few enemies because he rarely took a firm stand on anything. So who would have suspected that the man to succeed Woodrow Wilson, America's most visionary president, would be a man who saw the president's role as largely ceremonial. Warren Harding was raised in a small town in Ohio. His wholesome and picture book childhood, farm chores, swimming in the local creek, and playing in the village band was the basis of his down-home appeal later in life. As a young man, Harding brought a nearly bankrupt newspaper, the Marion Star, back to life. The paper became a favorite with Ohio politicians of both parties because of Harding's even-handed reporting. Always well-liked for his good-natured manner, Harding won a seat in the Ohio State Senate, serving two terms before becoming a U.S. Senator from Ohio in 1914. During his term as Senator, Harding missed more sessions 
than he attended, being absent for key debates on prohibition and women's suffrage. Taking no stands meant making no enemies, and his fellow Republicans awarded Harding the 1920 presidential nomination, sensing the nation's fatigue with the reform agenda of Woodrow Wilson, running with the slogan, A Return to Normalcy. Harding beat progressive Democrat James M. Cox in a massive landslide. Once in office, Harding admitted to his close friends that his job was beyond him. The capable men that Harding appointed to his cabinet included Charles Evans Hughes as Secretary of State, Andrew Mellon as Secretary of the Treasury, and Herbert Hoover as Secretary of Commerce. But he also surrounded himself with dishonest cheats, who came to be known as the Ohio Gang. Many of them were later charged with defrauding the government, and some of them went to jail. Though Harding knew of the limitations of men like Harry Daughtry, the slick friend he appointed attorney general, he liked to play poker with them, drink whiskey, smoke, tell jokes, play golf, and keep late hours. Known as a good fellow, Harding enjoyed being liked more than he prized being a good leader. Though Harding was never linked to any crooked deals, the public was aware of his affairs with at least two women. Carrie Phillips, who had been a German sympathizer during the war, tried to blackmail Harding and was paid hush money by the Republican Party. Nan Britton, a pretty blonde, 30 years younger than the president, was given a job in Washington, D.C. so that she could be near Harding. The two often met in the Oval Office, and their affair continued until Harding's death. Decidedly conservative on trade and economic issues, Harding favored pro-business government policies. He allowed Andrew Mellon to push through tax cuts for the rich, stopped antitrust actions, and opposed organized labor. Harding knew little about foreign affairs when he assumed office, preferring to give Secretary of State Hughes a free hand. Hughes was concerned with securing foreign markets for wealthy American banks, such as the one run by John D. Rockefeller. Hughes and Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover used the Fordney McCumber, tariff to secure oil markets in the Middle East, especially in modern-day Iraq and Iran. His administration revised Germany's war debts downward through legislation passed in 1923 known as the Dawes Plan. Hughes also called for a naval conference with nine other nations to freeze naval spending in an effort to reduce spending. Shaken by the talk of corruption among the friends he had appointed to office, Harding and his wife Florence, or Flossie Harding, organized a tour of the western states and Alaska in an attempt to meet people and explain his policies. After becoming ill with what at the time was attributed to food poisoning, Harding had a heart attack and died quietly in his sleep. The rumors flew that Flossie had poisoned the president to save him from being engulfed in the charges of corruption that swept his administration. The Hardings never had any children, and Flossie died of kidney disease in 1924. Most historians regard Harding as the worst president in the nation's history. In the end, it was not his corrupt friends, but rather Harding's own lack of vision that was most responsible for the tarnished legacy. His Masonic record is, he was initiated on June 28, 1901 in Marion Lodge No. 70, Marion, Ohio. And because of some personal antagonism, Brother Harding's advancement was hindered until 1920, by which time he had been nominated for president. He was actually blackballed on the first petition for membership in 1901, on the objection and rumor over his heritage. That impediment was overcome, and he was made an entered apprentice in June of that year, and delaying further progress for 20 years. And on August 27, 1920, he achieved the sublime degree of a Master Mason at Marion Lodge. At his request, Brother Harding took the oath of office for the President of the United States upon the same Bible as was used by Brother George Washington for the same purpose on April 30, 1789, the Altar Bible of St. John's Lodge No. 1, New York City. That's it for this week. Please find us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Whence Came You, check us out on Google Plus at the email address wcypodcast at gmail.com. You can email me at that email address or you can email me at admin at wcypodcast.com. Don't forget to check out the Midnight Freemasons three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Don't forget about the Masonic Roundtable live Tuesday nights at 10, 9 central if you like masonic podcasts and if you like conversation there's five of us we go back and forth we have special guests usually Uh, the next episode coming out is about the royal arch so check it out i think you'll really like it unfortunately i won't be there i will actually be at a york Rite type meeting giving brother brian shimian his ninth degree so i'm really excited and please order stephen harrison's tales from the craft we have those in stock and i can get them to you very quickly, $18 United States, $25 international. 
That's it, guys. Stay on the level. For whence came you, I'm Robert Johnson.